Aika, you dedicated 25 years of your professional life to promoting HPT and see introducing the concept into pharmacopias. When looking back, what would you consider as the key step in the evolution of the HPTLC? All right, I think everything started in the 1950s when TLC became very popular. In 1962, Stahl published his famous uh, Thin Layer Chromatography, a laboratory handbook, and that was 500 pages summarizing what was known about the technique in German language. Uh, four years later, the second edition was already grown to 1,000 pages, and that represents the uh, large attention that the technique was getting at this time. But besides book, and there have been many books being published afterwards, there's uh, a lot of different parallel developments. So maybe we look at this slide first. And here you see <clears throat> the 70, uh, 73 years of evolution in the European pharmacopoeia and the United States pharmacopoeia. In 1969, TLC was already described as a general technique. And 20 years later, in 89, the TLC was part of all monographs. It was actually the dominant chromatographic technique. So HPLC was not an official technique at this time? No, at that time there was no HPLC. HPLC was introduced into the pharmacopoeia in 85 and also the first monograph featuring an HPLC assay came in 95, uh, 85. Sorry. Yes. Uh, do you see the red line there? Yes. Well, that red line marks the year 1976. This is when Merck introduced their HPTLC plates that was silica gel with fine particles and a very uh, small size distribution. But you can see also it took about 30 years until 2005 um, before HPTLC was introduced as an entity into the pharmacopoeias. Meanwhile, in 1999, uh, the American Herbal Pharmacopoeia started to publish what we would call today images of HPTLC plates. Um, that concept was taken up in 2009, 10 years later, by the USP Dietary Supplement Compendium. Looks like a very slow process and a lot of hard work. Yes, uh, but let's not talk about this in too much detail. When you look at 2012, there was the uh, foundation of the International Association for the Advancement of HPTLC. And the first thing that they published was an SOP. And that SOP actually became the foundation uh, of the General Chapters 203 of the USP and the Chapter 2A25 of the European Pharmacopoeia. We can consider these chapters as the birth certificates of HPTLC as an independent but product neutral concept. Later on, HPTLC uh, developed much further into a separate analytical technique. So at least in the context of the pharmacopoeias. Well, yes, um, there's only the USP and the European pharmacopoeia which make that clear distinction. Um, the Indian pharmacopoeia has a separate chapter on HPTLC and the British pharmacopoeia actually is part of the European pharmacopoeia does the same. And what is the meaning of the little stars that we can see here? I, I forgot those. Uh, so the, uh, the stars are marking our uh, years of birth and when we got involved with HPTLC. So yours are the red stars and mine are the blue stars. Well, let's hope that you are still around in 15 years and we can talk again about what HPTLC has become. You said that from a regulatory point of view, HPTLC is a product neutral concept. Yes, that's right. Then what about the equipment? Well, as you can see on this timeline here, equipment was developed over the years. So it was always focusing on the individual steps of the process. Only recently, um, Kamak put out a fully automated system that focuses on the entire process. But then when you see how uh, TLC was perceived, there was no change over more than 30 years. Only very recently, um, the focus was on HBTLC plates, and that looks a little different, but this is only in 2017. The pharmacopoeia always look at this uh, process in a product neutral way. So they are not talking about specific equipment. And the uh, only requirement is that the suitable equipment is used, but it's not really clear what suitable is for. So for you, when was it possible to do HPTLC? Okay, so then when we look at uh, 1976 again, I think we could uh, call this the uh, HPTLC 1.0. At this time, we have the HPTLC plates and also we have a lot of equipment on the market. So this is uh, application devices, uh, developing chambers, and also 
uh, devices for evaluation, including a scanner and a photo documentation system. So these things together, I would call HPTLC 1.0, as I said. But at that time, nobody really thought about that. Okay, that makes sense. So when we uh, continue looking at the development of equipment, there was also specific equipment besides of what we have just seen. Uh, there was a uh, developing chamber that could do gradients, the AMD. There was an overpressure technique called OPLC. And recently there was also or is hyphenation with MS. But none of this equipment actually changed the way uh, HPTLC was defined. I see. So at that point, the instrument were determining what was possible in HPTLC. But then, how do you see the role of the scientific community in shaping HPTLC? Yeah, so the, there was always great scientific support. And I said uh, it started with Stahl's book, but later on there have been many good books published. And they always summarized the state of the art in HPTLC. There were book chapters in encyclopedias. There are thousands of papers published uh, on HPTLC. And this is still going on. Google Alert finds about 10 to 15 papers every week. There's even a specific journal for planar chromatography since 1989. And there is a series of symposia dedicated to the subject. But the uh, term HPTLC is always fuzzy. But why? Because everything started out as TLC and later on it was named instrumental TLC and to set uh, things differently than with the journal, the term planar chromatography was used as synonym for modern planar chromatography. And later on it became TLC slash HPTLC and even with the Symposia series, as you can see on the slide, they always change their name. And even the, uh, even if you look at CAMAC, the world leaders of planar chromatography, they have not really adopted to the term HPTLC. So if we want to talk about HPTLC, we have to stick to the definition by the pharmacopoeias or what the association says about it. I think that it can be quite confusing for someone from the outside. Or most people might not even care that there is no official definition for HPTLC. But now, if we look at some practical aspect. Yes, then uh, we can look at three elements. What is known, what is available, and what is viable. So the scientific basis was discussed, uh, the instruments we have discussed as well. So what are we going to do with this? Of course, we can do research and we can always do routine analysis and everybody does what they want. But then there is this aspect of regulatory compliance. And some in, uh, industries have to be in compliance with certain regulations. And then when you ask the question at the end, it comes down to the cost. So what do I get back in return of my investment for expensive equipment? And only if this pays out, then there's progress and there's acceptance of the technique. And I personally think at the moment, we're talking too much about the high price of the HPTLC, while it should be the high performance of the HPTLC. Can you be a bit more concrete and give us an example? Yes. So when we talk about regulatory compliance, um, if the pharmacopoeia, for, examples, uh, for example, asks you to look at the plate and identify the amount of impurity by visual evaluation, then why should you buy a scanner? And if they ask you to um, describe a chromatogram that you see in comparison to a table description, then why should you buy an HPTLC equipment? So this kind of creates a vicious cycle. When you um, want to put something in a regulation that is not of regular uh, use and it is not a regular laboratory equipment, then uh, the industry is going to refuse to buy that. So <clears throat> one example is the turn of the century when everybody was looking at uh, HPLC. And at that time, nobody really disputed the usability of HPLC, uh, even though there was a lot of cost associated to this. People saw that TLC was not capable of doing uh, quantitative uh, determination as well as HPLC, and they decided to eliminate TLC completely from the monographs. And they did not consider putting HPTLC in instead because of the association with a horizontal developing chamber. And that was considered to be a non-standard uh, equipment. So that's why um, it was not taken up. That was about 20 years ago, but it must have been very scary. Yes, indeed, it was very scary. So how was it resolved? 
Well, we had two strategies. One was the uh, focus on the miniaturization. So um, we considered HP TLC plates as TLC plates, just smaller, and we could use the same equipment, for example, a twin trough chamber. And this is how uh, it was possible to position HP TLC in parallel to TLC in the general chapter of the European and United States Pharmacopoeia. So I think that without that move, we might be having a quite different discussion today. Well, that is uh, quite possible, but there was another very lucky uh, strike, and that uh, concerns the uh, creation of um, good current manufacturing practices for the botanical industry, with which the US FDA started to regulate the botanical industry in the United States. Around that time, um, no uh, HPC methods for identification were there, because everybody focused on assays. And a central element of the CGMPs was the um, identification of a material. They call it this 100% identification rule, which means every time a material changes custody, it needs to be properly identified using suitable methods. As I said, the HPLC didn't have methods for identification, just for quantification, but HPTLC was ready. We had a lot of methods, we had an SOP, we had standards, and we even had a book to describe all this. And from then on, um, HPTLC became very uh, much embraced by the botanical industry and today it's even enforced by the US FDA. I'm glad that at least one industry regularly using HPTLC. You previously mentioned that 2012 was another turning point because it was the year of the inauguration of the HPTLC Association. Yes, that is right. So. With the standardization, we have uh, made another important move. Um, when you think about HPTLC as an offline process that is uh, using the plate as an open system, we have uh, the individual steps all going on after one another. So we have the application, we have the development, then we can do a diversization or we can skip that. Then we can have a detection or multiple detections, and then we can also have an evaluation. The point is that all of these steps uh, require to set a number of parameters and they all affect the outcome. So if you have an SOP that standardizes all these parameters, you can also use software to control all the instrumentation and you have fully CGMP compliant data. So this together with the availability of a lot of methods, and so-called plug-and-play methods, which you could download and take the results and compare them with electronic standards or with a uh, data that was published as a PDF somewhere. Everything was ready for doing HPTLC. So this is the SOP that we published in the association in 2012. Is it the SOP use has basis for the general chapter 203 and 2825? Yes, exactly. This is exactly the thing that was then a little bit modified in the phrases, but uh, the, t the content is exactly the same. And this is what it produces. In 2012, we have uh, analyzed some reishi mushrooms that became part of a DSC monograph. And four years later, a United States high school student came to our laboratory and worked on the same kind of uh, mushrooms. And what you can see is that the uh, data blends right in. That is quite convincing, but do you have another example? Yeah, of course, I have more examples than that. <laughs> so um, here you see uh, chamomile, and that was analyzed in the United Kingdom and in Switzerland, left and right. And we have analyzed the chamomile for flavonoids and for essential oils. And you also see here that everything blends right in. So I believe you. Now, can you just summarize what standardization in HPTLC is? Yes, so we can put this in a nutshell, and I'm not going to read all of this to you because it is published in many different uh, positions. But when you take these parameters and fix them, then you can get reproducible data every day and everywhere. And we need to keep in mind, from a regulatory point of view, HPTUC is just a concept. There is no specific equipment necessary. That is really simple. Let us come back to the economic side. Yes. So. Um, when we look at the TLC plate, we use very, very simple equipment. This just costs a couple hundred dollars, maybe, at the most. So then you look at a sample on the plate in uh, comparison to a standard which is on the same plate. If you use the same kind of equipment, you can also do HPTLC, because this is just using standardized 
parameters. But what you get is that you can uh, have reproducible plate and you can look at samples that come from different plates. So this is the fundamental difference. And then if you add some instruments, you can also get full G uh, CGMP compliance and you will have data that is comparable to published data. And yeah, on the downside, it's about uh, 200 times more uh, in price than a regular TLC approach. 200 times seems stiff. On the other hand, if it is not too much when we remember that simple TLC costs next to nothing. But I also think that the investment for HPTLC will play for itself quickly because the instrument will replace manual labor. But there is more to gain, right? Yes, of course. So when we look at uh, the way the European pharmacopoeia uh, checks the HPTLC plates, then we have uh, markers here. We have intensity markers of two different concentrations. The higher concentration marks a zone, the lower concentration marks a faint zone. And then all the zones in the chromatogram are actually compared against this. So we have intense zones, um, equivalent zones, faint zones, and very faint zones. This in essence means that we have uh, attributes assigned to the zone intensity and that uh, actually is a description of quantitative information that is in the chromatogram. It's not bad but uh, it's not very objective. So yes you're right but we are talking about identification and the uh, pharmacopoeias they do not describe equipment they just give you acceptance criteria and we can use this we could use a scanner for that but this is not really part of the qualitative process. So when we look at the picture um, we can convert this, this picture into uh, further information. We can use peak profiles from images out of this. So let's first look at one track of this chromatogram. It is made out of pixels and those pixels uh, contain red, green and blue channels. From those channels we can call the luminance as a sum of one third of each channel. If that luminance is then plotted as a function of the IF value, you get a peak profile from image, which we can integrate and quantitatively evaluate. So in addition to the picture, you also have the quantitative information at the same point. So what is so special about it? Well, it is extra information that we can gain at an extra mouse click. So there's no extra equipment needed for that. But we could do that better with the scanner. Well, yes, we could, but then the scanner is not used for identification. And we are talking about identification here. So when we look at uh, this slide here, um, we call this concept uh, comprehensive HPTLC fingerprinting or HPTLC 3.0. So what we do is actually we take the image and retrieve the information that is inside and we have the peak profiles from image. And at this point, we can add scanners as well to uh, obtain information that is not available in the white light, in the visible light. So this comprehensive HPTLC fingerprinting produces qualitative and quantitative image analysis. So you mean that for each sample, multiple set of qualitative and quantitative data can be stored in one analysis? Yes. So we have a data file that has all this information. And I think it is a little difficult to, um, to visualize for, for that reason. We have created this little animation here. Is that the so-called sea cucumber that I have heard you talking about? Yes, and actually I'm showing you here why. So this is, this is the actual sea cucumber. But from now on, let's use a little icon to summarize what we want to say. So this is the information that is uh, stored in the analysis file. That's okay. So, but let me come back to the economics one more time. How much extra investment that I does the comprehensive HPTLC fingerprinting require? Well, actually, uh, it is just the cost for extra software. So when you put this in here, then we can take the image that we have already gained for the um, identification and we get the quantification uh, accessible. Now, when you look at uh, this here, this is the same slide. We look at different caffeine containing drugs and they can be clearly differentiated by their fingerprint. At the red arrow, you see uh, the zone of caffeine. So all of these uh, samples contain caffeine, which you now can actually quantitatively evaluate either in an assay or you can do a limit test, for example, for uh, materials that have been decaffeinated. 
That makes sense. So instead of performing the HPLC assay of caffeine separately, as required by the USP, you can actually do everything in one analysis as long as the results are equivalent. Yes, that's right. But caffeine is just a simple marker. Do you have another more challenging example? Yes, I do. So let's come back to Ganoderma. Reishi mushrooms is a, a traditional Chinese medicine which has gained a lot of popularity also in the supplement industry. And today there are about two dozen different medicinal mushrooms that are promoted for specific health benefits. The USP has a monograph uh, on Ganoderma and in, it includes an HPTLC identification and an HPLC for assay of 10 ganoderic acids. Um, it uses a very long column and then very long gradient and requires a strong UPLC pump. So this becomes rather costly. And I'm going to show you how we can do all of this uh, with an, a, a comprehensive HPTLC fingerprinting. So first we had to optimize the method a little bit. So you see that um, the fingerprint is very specific and it can be discriminated from all the other mushrooms on the market. In this red rectangle we see um, the ganoderic acids which are very characteristic. So we look at those standards and we look at their UV spectra and that allows us to identify these, uh, the, these components in the actual material. Then we are going to convert the fingerprint into a peak profile from image. We look at the area where the ganoderic acids are located and then we quantify them as, uh, as a sum against the ganoderic acid A. That's a very simple approach. And guess what? What? Well, if you do that, you will save a lot of money. So you can save about 60% of the cost if you go to a simple new HPTLC instead of uh, using the USP HPTLC plus the UPLC assay. Not bad. Right. But I think right now we have covered uh, most of the uh, points that uh, lie in the past and you have uh, heard my personal opinion on the um, HPTLC evolution and most of this aspect. But I, I think there was one thing that we didn't really uh, talk too much about and that was the question of suitability of instruments and methods. Uh, would you mind going on and talking us uh, through your opinions on the subject? Uh, yeah, of course. So to be sure that the method and the instrument are working properly, the use of system stability test, also called SST, would be needed. So if we look at this slide, you see that in HPTLC, most, most of the regulation qualifies the analysis based on the resolution between two zones and the fingerprint pattern. As you can see here, uh, for the, the example of the sentence transport in the USP and the European Pharmacopoeia, you see that the resolution between the eperosid and the chlorogenic acid is requested, but none of them are mentioning the position of those zones in the entire chromatogram. So they are just asking for the resolution, but they are not comparing the, the, the RF value. So the fact that they are not mentioning RF value makes that the comparison between plate to plate is not possible. If we look at SSTs, it's a must-have in routine analysis. You need to perform SSTs on each plate. But if we consider the development of a new SST for each method, it can start to be quite expensive and time-consuming. That's why a general system stability test was developed. Can you uh, explain that a little bit more in detail? Certainly. So some of our customers in India raise concern about the time-consuming and expensive uh, nature of developing a system stability test for each method. We also encountered similar challenges while working on SSTs for diverse pharmacopoeia. To address th this issue, we collaborate with our distributor on Chrome and the company Sigma. We decided to adopt a more pragmatic approach by developing a solution that will contain a mixture of solvent or com of component. So you mean that you have something that you could use for all uh, analytical methods? Right. So you see here on this slide, you see that if you start with an SST solution containing, I don't know how many substances at the beginning, what we aim was to have a fixed uh, sequence of zone for each developing solvent. And we wanted to have at least three to four zones displayed in the entire chromatogram. The selected substance has to be detectable without derivatization because all the methods don't contain a derivatization step. 
So that means that uh, the substance has to be either seen on as a quenching zone or in long wave UV light as fluorescence or has to be our own color. Uh, yes, as you can see here are some examples. You see that uh, we have some components that are visible in white light or in short wave UV 254 nanometers or in 366 uh, in fluorescence. We also look at some other criteria like the selected substance have to be in of minimal hazard. So it means that this has to be not harmful for the user, but also for the environment. Then we look at some stability in solution that has to be at least stable in solution for two months. Then it has also uh, to be available everywhere and not expensive because our goal was that the user would be able to provide the, the, this solution or to produce himself this solution. So out of those 24 compounds, how many did you finally select? So then from the 24 substances, we have tested them with 20 different mobile phase, covering a wide range of polarity and selectivity. When we look at uh, the error value obtained, we just uh, compare and uh, mix them together. And we finally reached eight substances where, that were mixed in the methanol solution. And it's what we call the UHM. Mm -hmm. so, so uh, you think that this UHM can replace the, the current SSTs in the pharmacopoeia methods, for example? Yes, for that we have conducted what uh, is uh, requested by the robustness test. So we have uh, looked at uh, different changes in terms of uh, humidity, uh, in terms of composition of the mobile phase and also the saturation. If so you look at... Sorry, may I interrupt? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so that means you qualify each plate individually by this test? Yes. Mm -hmm. So if you look here uh, at this slide, you see that uh, with the humidity, uh, no matter which humidity you have uh, used, you can have a specific sequence of zone for the UHM. So we see that with uh, the UHM, we are ending the entire process of the standardization. So here it's what we call the HPTLC 3.1. Hmm. That's good. Very interesting. So now, um, I think there are still many people who need to develop their own specific HPLC or HPTLC methods for their specific analysis. Um, I think uh, today there's uh, often the, the, the trend to uh, non-targeted multi-component uh, multi analysis met methods around. So is there anything that we can do in HPTLC in this direction? Uh, yes, in HPTLC, general screening method exists, but they are still fo focusing on some specific phytochemical classes. For example, uh, if you look at flavonoid and phenolic compounds, we know that it's existing four developing solvents that are commonly used. This approach is simplifying the entire process, but for the user, he still needs to know which phytochemical classes he will have to target. So that's why uh, the lab came up with the idea of the complementary developing solvent. So complementary developing solvents, is there something new? Can you explain that a little bit more? Yes, of course. If you look at this slide, we see that for a non-targeted screening approach, we have first to overcome the limited separation due to the short developing distance. Then we have to expand the selectivity and polarity range of the developing solvent. So for that, we came up with the combination of three developing solvents, one of low polarity, one of medium polarity, and one of high polarity. If we reach that, then we will harmonize all the methods, use less solvent and less standard in the quality control labs. So isn't that something that the African herbal pharmacopoeia is using? Yes, indeed. The African pharmacopoeia, if you look here, is using three developing solvents and display the three chromatograms after the derivatization with vanillin reagent. So, and why didn't you not just co um, transfer this to HPTUC? So, if you look carefully, the African herbal pharmacopoeia initially seems like the approach we wanted to follow. However, upon closer examination of the solvent use, we realized that optimization was necessary to meet our requirement. We aim for less toxic solvent covering uh, all Snyder classification and also broadening the polarity range. So we settle at the end one low polarity and one medium polarity and one high polarity developing solvent here, as you can see here on this slide. Doesn't that create extra analytical effort? That's a valid concern, but let me explain how the CDS approach can actually save time and streamline the process. 
So um, we need to, you're right that for each sample, we need to perform three analyses using different developing solvent. However, if we consider the traditional approach where each unrelated sample requires a separated plate for analysis, the number of plate quickly adds up. With the CDS approach, we can analyze up to 14 unrelated samples on the same plate. All right, so that makes sense. And I see that it would also save time if you uh, analyze unrelated samples on the same uh, plate. But uh, do you think that uh, this CDS concept is equivalent in its output to these specific methods? To be honest, we couldn't entirely be sure at the beginning. It was an hypothesis based on the idea that by creating a composite of fingerprints, we would be able to obtain the same or even more information compared to the current specific method. And I'm sure you checked this. So how did you do that? So to validate our hypothesis, we focus on one of the major applications of HPTLC, which is the analysis of botanicals. In this context, HPTLC is commonly used for identifying individual botanical ingredients and discriminating them for, from other related species or potential adulterants. If we look at here, it's individual uh, ingredients, for example, the green tea, olive and peppermint leaf. We compare the result obtained with the composite fingerprint here in the middle to the result obtained during the specific developed method, for example, USP or European Pharmacopoeia, here on the right side. You can see that using the CDS, we have more information than the standard methods. Then now, if we look at uh, species coming from the same genus, here with the Angelica species, we find that the LPDS, or the low polarity developing solvent, provide equivalent result to the specific developed method. Well, this is good. This really is convincing. Um, did you also check for other applications besides botanicals? Uh, so yes, uh, we have expanded testing to include individual reference substances from various class, such as coumarin, flavonoid, triterpene, carbohydrates, or even some active pharmaceutical ingredients and lipids, for example. And I think this is, this is quite a, bright, a broad range of substances. And, and was it successful? Uh, for the maturity, yes. So if you look at here, uh, we see that the CDS approach was able to successfully classify and separate them. We observe positive results in most cases, like you see here, the classification of the coumarins, iridoid, and carbohydrate. Quite remarkable. So um, what are the limitations in your view? Uh, there are some limitations. Let me show you an example here. In that case, you can see that the CDS approach, uh, with the CDS approach, sildenafil citrate and vardenafil are quite close, if you look on the right side. Uh, so initially, for the, for the weight loss product, one specific method was developed with the USP. But if you look at here, we see that the RF value of uh, the Vardenafil and the Sinenafil citrate on the standard method in the bottom are well separated. So it is not the case with the CDS here. Well, I think this is life then. And so if people encounter these kind of uh, questions, then they can always go uh, and use a more specific method afterwards, right? Right. What they can do also, they, they can also develop or adjust their own CDS. So the thing is, they have to note that if they are deviating from this standardization uh, that we are doing with the CDS here, they will not be able to use our database. Talking about deviation, the plate resulting from the CDS are also qualified with the UHM. If you look at this slide here, we see that for each developing solvent, the UHM gives a specific sequence of zone and all components are well distributed in the 3D plot. So, all right, Tim, I think we have covered the evolution of HPTLC uh, in great detail. Could you uh, provide us a little summary? Yes, of course. If you look at this slide, we, say, we can say that it started, uh, the HPTLC started from the development of instrumentation, followed by standardization. Then came the concept of comprehensive HPTLC fingerprinting and the introduction of the general SST. We can say that the current state that uh, can be considered as the culmination of the evolution with the CDS representing the HPTLC 3.2. Right, so now everybody's waiting to hear what is 4.0. Can you please unveil the secret? 
So HPTLC 4.0 is a full control of HPTLC for each step, starting from the plate handling with no manual interference and environmental effect. The application is done with a defined volume and a defined position without cross-contamination. The development is controlled uh, by the gas phase for an optimum separation and reproducibility. For the derivatization step, the reagent volume, heating, cooling, timing, everything is mentioned in the method. Detection uh, is uh, done with the quantitative back hyperspectral information for each data point. So the elimination of the background linking the signal to the mass of the substance is also possible. We have also some mass spectrometry, so for the identification of substance for additional confidence in case. And for the evaluation process, uh, we can link that to some advanced algorithm for pattern recognition or identification of substance. To summarize HPTLC 4.0, we have here this slide. Uh, you have all unrelated samples are analyzed with standardized and qualified CDS approach. The significant amount of data can be saved in the cloud to generate an intensive database. Ah, a database. So what can we do with this database? So we are currently exploring some options. One option we are considering is developing a comprehensive database that incorporates all the information we gather. This database could assist in compound identification or peak assignment. So for that, uh, we during our testing, we collected data from 180 reference substances. Each substance has three RF value related to the low polarity, medium polarity, and high polarity developing solvents. So if you have an unknown zone with a specific three RF values, you can use data mining techniques to query the database. By calculating the Euclidean distance, for example, you can find the closest match in the database. So these tools could be interesting in metabolomics, for example. Well, I think with this information, you can really identify a unknown compound very quickly, and this could save a lot of time and effort, particularly for natural product chemists, for example, right? Exactly. But we are also exploring the use of machine learning algorithms to predict RF value. This would be particularly useful when you have a reference substance and need to determine the most suitable developing solvent. So by training a model using the database, you will be able to create a predictive tools that suggest the optimal developing solvent to use. So to understand that correctly, so you are saying uh, with that database that can predict uh, F values and also predict uh, suitable solvents for separation of compounds, if we combine that with the comprehensive HPTLC fingerprinting, this could be a true game changer. Yes, uh, but there is more to it. If uh, while this proof of concept was based on a small database, imagine the potential of uh, this database when numerous users will contribute to filling it with their own data. And you have also to think that the HPTLC is not just error value. There is more spectral information behind. You have the color of the zone, and you also have some bioactivity that are all the crucial aspect of HPTLC analysis. Hmm. Well, I think what you have presented here is really amazing. And I'm, I'm really happy to see how quickly the HPTLC is adjusting now to the modern age of digital information. But I also see that, particularly in the case of this uh, database, there's a lot of collaboration that is needed. So maybe it is a good point here to invite all of the people who are watching us today to consider collaborating with us on such a uh, database and on the development of the future of HPTLC. And at this point, I think it's time to uh, change the title here a little bit. And we want you to actually say what we think the giant could look like. All right. So with this, I thank you very much for your attention. I thank you, Tin, for this inspiring discussion. And that's all from my side. Thank you, Eike. Goodbye.